from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and Akashvani. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell and the reason why I wasn't with you last week is that I was on an aeroplane and I'm now on Jim's time zone. I'm in Melbourne. A lovely place for you to play your guitar and it's <laughs> nice to see you. In Australia, it's Jim Maxwell for the ABC. I'm in Sydney, summer is here, and it's going to be a scorcher this weekend. So, happy cricket season. The summer has arrived. <laughs> well, it's winter time here in India, uh, but I'm back in Bangalore only just uh, for Rakash Pani. This is Charu Sharma. Now, on this week's Stumped, we will get to the public spat between former Aussie teammates. But we're going to start this week with one of the most dramatic finals in the history of the Women's Big Bash League in Australia. Now, there were more than 12,000 fans in at Adelaide Oval. Whether you think that's a big number for a final or not, uh, we can come to that. But it all came down to Brisbane Heat needing 13 runs from the final over to beat the defending champions, Adelaide Strikers. Heat fell just three runs short. Uh, they lost two wickets wickets in that final over. It means Adelaide, the strikers, are now back-to-back champions. So, Jim, on last week's show, we talked about some of the stars of the strikers team. Uh, It was Amanda Jade Wellington who was the hero, taking those two wickets in that last over to seal victory. I mean, just how good was she and has she been this tournament? Uh, She's a a very, very good competitor and she held her nerve. She backed her skill uh, to get those wickets because... (laughs) The opportunity was there for her to be donged over the top and over the boundary, but on two occasions, the catches went up in the air and they were held. So uh, as, as a wrist spinner, you know, uh, there's always the chance that you'll, you'll go the journey. And, um, well, she backed up that, that confidence, uh, that desire by bowling just the right deliveries uh, that resulted in those two crucial wickets. What a game, though. Yeah, that final was a really wonderful finale. Now, one player who was playing in her first ever WBBL final was the Zimbabwean leg spinner, uh, Anesu Mashangwe, who has become the first player from her country to win the Women's Big Bash League. And she joins us now on Stumped. Anessa, great to have you on. Just talk us through, first of all, the emotions of that final over. Just how did it feel being on the field? To be honest, um, I felt really calm and uh, confident that we're going to make it because, I mean, we have defended less than that before. Uh, I remember in the Sydney Thunder game, it was almost the same scenario. So um, I felt like the energy around the group, they were calm as well in that moment. Mm. And of course, it's not your first season with the Strikers, but your first really sort of season where you've established yourself in 17 wickets across the competition. How much have you enjoyed it? And have you learned a lot by those who you're playing with during this season? Um, yes, I've learned a lot from um, Megan Shute, uh, Talia, Amanda Jade Wellington, even Gemma Busby, uh, how to go about different situations and especially with Talia, uh, how to maintain a certain level of uh, calmness depending with, uh, with the situation. So yeah, it's been, it's been great. I feel like I've um, gained a lot being around them and it has helped my bowling as well. Yeah, and to talk about your bowling, you taught yourself leg spin, didn't you? H- how did you manage that? Tell us about it. Well, I was in a rush. Um, <laughs> I was, I think, 18, 18 19, because I used to be a medium pace bowler. So I wanted to make it into the Zimbabwean team. And I didn't see myself making it with my pace bowling and being a better as well. I didn't myself I didn't see myself making it that way. And then I just yeah opted to try spin and then I went the faster way, like using my fingers more without using my wrist. So literally I it was just self-taught everything. It's amazing. Jim <laughs> Uh, Jim Maxwell in, in Sydney, uh, and it's, it's nice t- to be talking to you. So there's obviously a fair bit of background to all of this. Can we go back and start where it all started for you in being absorbed in this wonderful game of cricket? How did it happen? Well, growing up, I used to love sports. So where I used to live in Chitungwiza, I went to a school called Sekewan High School. 
And then there's a day where we were doing athletics. Everyone was forced to go running. And it wasn't my favorite uh, part of the sporting activities. And then there's a day where I just saw people playing cricket. And then I just went there and stood there the rest of the time. And then the following day, I gave an excuse that I didn't come for athletics because I was playing cricket. And then the teacher's like, ah, okay, fair enough. So from that day, I started going to cricket. Uh, there's a guy that I, that we used to live with uh, back in Zimbabwe as well. I'll give him more credit. Uh, his name is Kudzai. I told him that uh, I'm, I'm thinking of trying to play cricket. And then he's the one who actually gave me the confidence to actually do it and to see myself in the other, other side of the world with the sport. He is the one who started from scratch with me by catching the ball, throwing the ball, but we were using uh, lemons because we didn't have the balls to use. From that time, I fell in love with cricket. Uh, and then when I was 14, I got selected to play for the under-19 national team, that's Zimbabwe. But I couldn't go to South African tour because I didn't have money to pay for my passport. And then I was left out of mm. the team at uh, that time. And then I started taking ser uh, cricket seriously again when I was like 18 years old. And then I started being a regular in the Zimbabwe national team when I was uh, 20, 21, when I could finally learn my spin. <laughs> uh, during uni, I was thinking, what would I do after, um, like when I'm done with, with school? Because I didn't see myself like working in offices. Uh, the only thing that that made me see the other side of the world was just cricket. So I could see myself on the other side of the world just with cricket. And they said that's fascinating about your background in Zimbabwe, but how did you come to be in Australia? Glenelg here in Australia, they agreed to, to take me as well. But this time they were willing to pay my uh, visa, my flights and everything. So that was a positive. And then the mm. catch was as well, I will play second grade, hopefully if we win, and then we'll be upgraded to get an A grade status, which we did when I came over here. Um, yeah, I started living with my coach. He's uh, the Glenelg head coach at the moment, Graham Sejnari. He's like family to me now. I call him my Australian dad. From there, playing A grade for Glenelg, I was uh, being invited to play for the Scops first. Uh, there's a day I was selected to play to do the to play the trials, like to play the trial matches in the scops. And then a few months I worked hard on my bowling and um, I started feeling like I was fitting in well. And then I started being selected to, I mean, invited to train with the big bash girls, girls as well. And then I remember the second season I was invited. I felt like I feel like I can make it into this team. So when I got there, I was now comfortable um, around the group and I could feel that my bowling skills can actually compete. But the unfortunate thing was I didn't have the paperwork to allow me to be picked into the squad, either the Scorps or the um, Strikers. They couldn't do anything because part of my visa conditions was I can't be paid or work for another, another sponsor as well. Yeah, you've really been through the ringer. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you've given us the, the long story because there's so much there going all the way back to Zimbabwe <laughs> days. I mean, but what, what, what has, you know, really kept you driving and driving all, all these obstacles and difficulties that were put in your mm. path? You've, you've pushed on and pushed on. Where does that drive yeah, come from? Yeah. I don't know where it came from. Maybe it was because of my upbringing. Um, so, yeah, growing mm. up, you just had to work hard for for anything that you want. You just had to, sometimes you don't have, you, you wouldn't have like the support that you need. So you, you had to believe in yourself, trust in yourself and just push yourself and just, um, yeah, that's that's how we grew up. Anesu, this is Charu Sharma from Bangalore, India. What a remarkable story. Congratulations on everything that you've done. Uh, I, I have Thank to you. ask you though, being, being the first world cricketer in the WBBL from Zimbabwe is the Zimbabwean Cricket Board sharing anything with you in terms of your progress? Are they a partner here with you or are you just entirely on your own? 
I yesterday actually spoke to the head of cricket, um, Give Mo Makoni. It was me actually thanking him how much support he gave me to to come here. Um, because at first he's the one who allowed me, like who helped me process the paperwork for me to be allowed to play here. So yeah, I'm still in contact with them. Um, and yeah, they always wish me well. Yeah, we are still in contact. Well, Anessu, thank you so much for sharing your story with us because it is it is a remarkable one and we will watch you with interest as you continue your cricket career, as you said, you're right at the very start. So congratulations on winning the WBBL. From the BBC World Service, this is Stumped on Akashvani. Well, next on Stump, something of a row has broken out in Australia amongst uh, former Australian teammates, specifically former bowler Mitchell Johnson, questioning whether his old teammate David Warner should be given what he has called a hero send-off in the Test Series against Pakistan. Now, Warner, who's a veteran of 109 tests, has said that he wants to retire from the format on his home ground, the SCG, this January. The 37-year-old rescued a poor run of form last January with a double hundred in his 100th test match when questions had been swirling around about his form and his place in the side. Now, he hasn't had the greatest run since. Uh, Remember, Warner was given a 12-month ban from cricket for his part in Sandpaper Gate, the ball-tampering scandal that rocked Australia's 2018 tour of South Africa. Now, let me recap for you what Mitchell Johnson has said. He was writing in his weekly column in the West Australian newspaper... He said, as we prepare for David Warner's farewell series, can somebody please tell me why? Why a struggling test opener gets to nominate his own retirement date? And why a player at the centre of one of the biggest scandals in Australian cricket history warrants a hero's send-off? It's been five years, he goes on, and David Warner has still never really owned the ball tampering scandal. Now, there was much more, Jim, wasn't there, that was that was written uh, in the column as well. Uh, Warner is in the Australian squad for the first test in Perth next week, and it does seem highly likely that he will feature in a farewell test in Sydney. Um, first of all, on Mitchell Johnson's comments, what have you made for them? Were they warranted? How did you take them? I think it was too personal, far too personal. Um, we saw when Justin Langer was relieved of his coaching job, Mitchell Johnson fired up in support of his West Australian mate. And I think there have been times, unfortunately, where Mitchell Johnson, during the course of his career as a player and and now as someone that looks back on the game, has um, lacked judgment, maybe emotional immaturity is part of it. Certainly there's a lot of passion, and I respect massively what Mitch and normally has to say, but on this, I think he's off the ball. Um, David Warner has not been pressured by anyone in the last six months to lose his place in the team. And it's ludicrous to suggest that anyone else could take his place on merit at the moment. And when you look at his record, he will go down in history as one of the greatest players Australia's ever had. And across three formats of the game, he scored 18,000 runs for his country, 25 test centuries. So, Mitch, I think you've got that wrong. If you've got a gripe, pick up the phone and speak to him. Well, it certainly felt that in the, you know, a week out from the test series starting, there was precious little else for the newspapers to be getting stuck into. So, you know, opportune time to, to jump all over and almost sort of creating something you know, to, <coughs> to keep keep the headlines going. And, of course, players are, you know, have been more than willing to, as Quadra in particular, to, to come to the defence of Warner. And it keeps fueling the fire at the moment in the absence of on-field rivalries between the teams that often would be, you know, the focus of uh, of this sort of build-up. I mean, Cherry, one place where Warner is not a polarising force seems to be India, where, you know, he, he has a hugely popular following, doesn't he? Has, has this kind of spat made the headlines in India in any way? Well, strangely enough, they have. Yes, there's been a fair amount of mention because it's all of the social media. And I think a lot of the regular media takes most of their material from the social media. So there's been a lot of uh, recounting of what's happened between Mitch and and Dave Warner. And of course, Warner uh, still uh, playing in India and a force in the IPL, though not as much as the past, uh, has also once again earned a few more fans because he sent a a social media message to all those in Chennai. They've gone through a major flood the last couple of days. Uh, yeah, I think his equity in India has not lessened at all. While Mitch Johnson is 
well, to the cricketing public in India, perhaps faded away a bit. But Warner's still very much there. So I have to confess that he still has a lot of sympathy here. When you look at Warner and his uh, his legacy, if you like, then, Jim, to what extent is Sam Papergate going to stay with him? It's going to stay with him. It's going to stay with Australia. And we saw that with the Bearstow incident at Lord's. So it, it'll never leave Australia in the near term, um, that accusation about being cheats and sandpaper. It's going to hang around for a long, long time. And whether or not David Warner tips a bit of petrol on it with a, the revelations in a book uh, remains to be seen. But uh, he probably needs to tread a bit carefully once he does stop playing for Australia uh, to make sure that um, his reputation is a bit stronger than it has been for a lot of his career. But when you look, as I've said, at his numbers, you can't deny that he has been one of our greatest players. And Charry, final thought from you when it comes to sort of public slangings. Has there many instances amongst the Indian team that you can recall where disagreements or sort of public dislikes get played out through the media? Well, there has been enough conjecture on that front. You know, there must have been, say, 50 instance, uh, instances where there should have been more open comment because otherwise it just remains rumour and conjecture on behalf of the media. But of late, I think the Indians are generally a little more reticent to uh, to wash their laundry in public. But uh, there's been, oh, even now, there were uh, the situations where Rohit Sharma was not supposed to be getting along with Kohli and Kohli was not supposed to be getting along with somebody else. But I think directly so. Of course, there was a slap gate between Harbhajan and, and Sri Shan. So there have been, you know, a lot of situations which could, could have gotten worse. But I think the players have generally been quieter because uh, that's just the nature here. Well, that's all we've got time for on this week's Stumped here on Akash Vani. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter. We're at BBC WS Sports and use the hashtag BBC Stumped. And check us out on YouTube as well. Go to the BBC World Services YouTube channel to watch us. Thanks to Charu Sharma and to Jim Maxwell and to all of you. We'll do it all again next week. Bye for now. Stumped is a BBC Sport production for the BBC World Service in association with ABC and Akashvani. 